Right. Welcome, everybody. I'm just going to move my face so I can see myself. I hope you're all well today. Um, my name is Tim Kelly. I am the principal physiotherapist at Physio Fitness in Sydney, which you probably gather. Um, here, it's all about helping the fitness community with significant pain and injuries and surgery. Our job is to make them a successful return to sport and exercise. And today, I thought I'd share my little insights into what I believe is how rehab should be done right. Um, I've been a physio for like over 25 years now, so I'm getting a bit old. Um, I start off in private practice straight away. So I've been doing rehab for 25 years. I'll come to the start of my career in a minute, but I've always moved from uh, doing, oh, I was in a rugby club, then I moved to corporate gyms and then public gyms, and now I've got my own sports and new clinic. And so I've been around fitness and exercise for a very long time. Um, and so today um, is all about trying to share with you what I've finally worked out over those years to improve everybody. Now, a lot of housekeeping, we're going to have a lot of people coming into this room. Um, I know you guys probably want to ask a lot of questions as we go. Can we save some of those questions to the end? We have a decent time for a bit of q and I'll be here for a while. So if you want some specific stuff, you can ask it then. Um, otherwise, just put your hand up. So um, in a nutshell, we all know that um, well, I'm speaking from a physiotherapy point of view. Some of you guys may not be physiotherapists. You might be exercise phys, osteos, chiros. But from a uh, pretty, speaking from a physio point of view, I feel the big focus is still with us is around pain. Um, you know, as physios, we can get stuck in that acute pain phase where that patient comes in. We're treating them for pain for first and foremost, and we're seen as that acute pain specialist, if you like. Um, you know, get me out of pain. I've done my back in. Can you help me? Sort me out. Get me out of pain. Um, and that's sort of like the focus on that session. And we can get a little bit lost with like focusing on getting them out of pain. The hard part, or one of the hardest things a practitioner is trying to then transition them into, I need you strengthening to get you out of pain. You know, and, I, and keep them going to get them stronger so they get 100% um, and stop recurring the problem. And so, you know, the biggest trouble you'll face with that is once, usually once someone's out of pain, let's say it's a lower back, once they're out of pain, that's their trigger to say, I'm fixed, you know, I'm done. I don't need the physio anymore because I'm out of pain, I'm very busy. Um, but then they have that hurdle, especially if they, like with people we treat, if they are a fitness person, they've got a big hurdle to go from, from being out of pain to then actually lifting weights or whatever they're going to do in exercise wise. And so there's a big gap from acute injury to that full of strengthening. And we're going to try and fill up that gap and get you guys an idea of how you're going to transition that person or transition yourself, if you like, to fill that gap up with exercise all the way through and rehab all the way through, not just for strengthening phase, but for the pain relieving phase. Um, and the secret is, can you keep that person on board for long enough to be able to do that. And part of your job is in writing rehab programs is to get it good enough to keep them on board because that is going to be the secret and you getting them better and you know allows you to see them enough times. Because at the end of the day, if you want good outcomes with that client, you've got to see them enough times. So what we're going to go through is starting to talk about what I call walking the walk. All right. We're going to go through what you should be doing as a practitioner. How you've got to think about rehab as a principal side of things, not just doing a recipe of exercises. How you're going to then go and transition. How do I get them doing exercise in my treatment sessions so I can teach them that and teach them that exercise um, is the way forward. Working out what you are going to do, what you need to think about when you are selecting exercises and then using perhaps an idea that we have of our progression method for going from if you have a base exercise, then you're going to, how do I regress that depending on the person's pain or problem or conditioning? How do I progress that? How to make it more unstable, or adding stability options, adding load options. So it gets quite complicated. We've got flow charts for that, um, but that'll help you work out how I'm going to progress that person through. And some of the little secrets are going to be in about how do I get an exercise's progress along the track rather than just doing replacing it with a new exercise. How do I actually get one exercise and progress it all the way through um, for that person. 
We'll also touch on areas of focus, what you need to be thinking about inside your program. So if you were doing a rehab program for a knee or a shoulder or lower back, whatever it is, um, what you need to be thinking about inside that program, what you're going to give them. Of course, not everyone's going to have everything in their program, um, but it'd be just widening your sort of ideas about what I should be thinking about. Um, the components is more about what is actually going into a program in total, not just the exercise. What else are you going to give that person? And we'll, we'll dive into that. But on compliance, and we'll talk about a few other things like the courses and the Q&A. So if we're going to talk about walk the walk, um, let's dive into that a little bit. Um, we'll go through a few of these things um, to give you some ideas. Remember, this is going to be videoed, so you'll be able to look back on this and look at the slides um, as well. So if I come off the slides when I unshare like this, um, then you'll be able to see um, those slides anyway when you go back to the video. So um, walk the walk. What do I mean by that? I mean, as a practitioner, when you're asked maybe it's at the coffee shop this morning or when you went down to a birthday party last week when you get asked what do you do and i would say oh, i'm a physio i'm this now do you do the people that you meet go oh you're a physio awesome listen i've got this problem and you probably have this house i've got this knee and that sort of thing can you help me with this but do they see you as like Oh, you're a physio. Yes, you're the person who can get me out of pain. Uh, can you fix my thing by giving me less pain? Can you uh, massage me and, and mobilize me a little bit and, and give me a bit of pain relief? Or are you seeing as the physio that they say, oh, great, you're a physio. Listen, can you educate me on what exercises I need to do, teach me how to do them myself so I can get stronger and get out of pain and get back to the sport I'm doing? Pretty much the most of the time, it's the former that I get. I'm a mess. They're thinking in their brain, he's the guy who's going to fix me with his hands and make me feel better. And hopefully he doesn't give me too many exercises that I need to do. Um, I like to think, as you guys, you can confidently say over time, especially from today, today onwards, to say I'm seen as the person that knows everything about exercise rehab and they see me as the person that's going to get them stronger get them out of their injury, fix their injury, if you like, back to sport or whatever they're going to do. Because previously, like I'm, you know, 48 now, um, back in the day, or when I started, but it was all manual therapy and it was all about pain relief. And we weren't regarded as the exercise experts or anything like that. Admittedly, we did, I did my McKenzie course in 98, so there was a lot of movement going on there. But there wasn't any strength thing going on. We had a we had a clinic with a little room up top, and we were in a sports club. It was a sports clinic, but the rehab I cannot remember what I was doing. I certainly wasn't teaching people how to deadlift. I wasn't. I couldn't deadlift myself. I wasn't doing any scapular pressing. Maybe some band work. A lot of things like wobble boards were there, but it wasn't really a. It was very an acute phase. Oh, I do a few of these exercises and go home. We did no medium of video format we had nothing to do and i guess a lot of that problem of not having video is so they went home they had a sheet of paper and they didn't do them so one of the problems is and we'll talk about this later and in, in today is the compliance issue and how you get them doing the exercise is going to be quite important for you if they go home with a sheet of paper and some stick figures or some photos they're not really going to do them they're certainly not going to do them very well that'll impact on your incomes outcomes and income um, and that's going to be a problem for you. So we've got to try and get around that um, because the, I believe that as a physio or allied health professional that is dealing with pain and injuries and surgery, to be any good, you have to be able to prescribe those, those exercises you prescribe, you have to be able to do it yourself. Okay, You have to know how to do those exercises that you're giving on that sheet or on that video, on your app, whatever you've got, that they're doing for homework, you have to be able to know them inside out and you have to be able to teach them because they are getting a lot of stuff from social media. It's dumping down through Instagram. There's so much stuff out there. It's getting a bit nauseating, um, but they're learning stuff online. And if you are not, you know, aware of what's going on there and what they're doing and knowing whether to, how to correct them, if they're doing it poorly, knowing what the right exercises to do, 
you won't be seen as the exercise professional. They're going to start trusting Instagram instead. So for me, I think the trust component is going to be crucial for your career. You need uh, someone, you know, your client that comes in, they need to be able to relate to you. They need, you need to be able to give them the confidence that you know what you are doing as far as I can teach them how to do an effective single leg squat. I know how to do a push up. I can know how to do all the exercises that they need to be doing um, because you've done it yourself. You can show that you know how to do it. You would, oh, she really knows what she's doing. You know, she, I can trust that person. She's awesome. Um, because all the text knowledge in the world and the stuff you give is not going to make a lick of difference if in their eyes, they see you as a person who doesn't really know what they're doing as far as exercise. So it's going to be pretty hard. And I find it's pretty, until I got good at doing the exercise myself, it was pretty hard to keep that person on board. Now I can keep that person on board really well because they are, you know, looking at me going, he knows what he's doing. And then they follow my lead and I can instruct them really well. Um, and it does come down to the queuing. Like once you know internally what you are doing, you go, I know how to cue this person because I know how to cue myself. And some of the times you can, you know, if you get that cueing right, when we get that really difficult person that doesn't really fit the box for their exercises, you just sort of you're going, this, why isn't this working? You know how to adapt and adjust that cueing and instruction to suit that individual because not everyone's going to be the same. Um, so Make sure that, you know, you, you take away from today that the biggest thing, and that's why I put it first, is as a practitioner, I implore you to be able to be the person that knows exactly what they're doing in their practice as far as their rehab. You're not just someone that's dishing out exercise and expecting something to go and do it at home. Um, because I, in my practice, I get a lot of people sort of, I call the secondhand people, and they are coming to me from other physios. Um, and they're biggest thing is they say oh, i went to the physio um i feel like they didn't really know exactly what they're doing they gave me a bit of massage they gave me a few exercises but they didn't really show me what to do they sort of just gave me in this app and i, I sort of really didn't do them because i didn't really know what i was doing or well, i didn't for a little bit and it didn't really get any better so it didn't just sort of really help me so here i'm thinking god this person just must not trust this physio right so I don't want you to fall into that sort of trap. You know, learn the exercises, get confident, um, and get to the point where they are saying, I trust them, I know that they know what they're doing. Just like they trust you for pain relief, they've now got to trust you for exercise rehab. And I always take this, um, this sort of like analogy, analogy, if you like, because I've worked with personal trainers so much and um have seen them work in the gym and seen them do good things and seen them do bad things, of course, as us as physios. Um, however, any questionable form sometimes they may have, or they may be looking at a client, you know, not doing something so that right. Usually they are, even if their forms are great, they are better at doing exercise and, and stronger than what I'm doing. Okay. And, and a, that was a, for a long time, I thought, how am I supposed to teach this person? This person's come in and they need to return to deadlifts and I can't get them, I can't bridge the gap, excuse the pun, I can't bridge the gap from a bridge to a deadlift because I don't know how to get that person stabilized. How on earth am I, where am I going to stop? I'd stop at bridges and just like, uh, go see your, your personal trainer to do deadlifts. I need to be getting that person up to the point where that personal trainer can take on. Because remember, People like they're going back to training or seeing trainers. Those trainers, they're not qualified to deal with injuries in surgery. If that person is still injured to a point and hasn't got enough strength to deadlift, then they're going to be stuck in that little conundrum where they might get re-injured and then they're not going to trust you again. So, you know, we know we know what to see when we see those things going wrong in the gym. We've got university a functional movement background. We know what to spot. We go, oh, she's doing that so wrong. But can you do it right? If you can spot what's going wrong, do you know what muscle is not working there? But can you exercise that muscle correctly? Can you get, and if you can do it yourself, can you actually instruct that person to do it correctly? And then when they get stuck, show them what is exactly supposed to happen so they can visually see Oh, I'm supposed to do it that way, not just 
move your body to the left or lift your hip up or can you actually do it? That's going to be crucial for you. And you just got to try and we got to try and use all that knowledge that we've learned and put it into practice because what happened at uni is we didn't put it into practice. We have to put it into practice now. And that takes a lot of time, right? Um, so what I want you to try and do is think about if you're going to fill the gap up, you're going to bridge that gap from pain to strengthening. You've also got to think about where do I stop? What is my scope of practice? And maybe you're not like in a clinic guy where I have to get them trying to do marathons and whatever they're going to do. Maybe you're in an aged care facility and all you have to do is get this person walking. At, or it's all relative in your scope of practice. You've got to still be able to show someone how to do an exercise if you're in that in that field. At the same time, you need to know exactly where your scope of practice ends. I know that I don't treat elite people. I don't go to the point where I'm trying to do amazing things to, to bridge the gap into strength conditioning for a sports team. I know where my scope ends and I'll hand that on. What I'm trying to get you to try and do though is just expand your scope and your toolbox a little bit. Whatever your scope is, get better in that point there. So you are rock solid all the way through what your scope is. Um, and then you're way more confident to get that person better. When you are thinking about rehab, I want you to think about the mindset of what well, your mindset, but it's also you got to think, I need to keep this person coming back for enough times and a reason to come back. Otherwise, I will not get them better. Rehab's not just about the amazing exercises that you give someone and like how awesome you are training. It's about if you can't get that person back enough times, you won't get your outcomes that you need. No matter how good your exercises are, they have to be coming back. And it's not about you know, your personality or what the price is. They want to be, they, you need to get them wanting to come back, okay? Oh my God, those exercises that Sharon gave me, you know, they're amazing. I'm definitely going back to physio because I feel heaps better. And they will think that the exercise is that, well, you fix them because you get an exercise, but it's, you, know, you know it's the exercise that fix them. But changing that mindset is part of your job of getting that person thinking, I'm coming back for exercises. I'm not just coming back to for a massage on the table. Um, you're not just getting that person out of pain anymore. You are getting that person over their injury and getting them, if you can, back to 100% or at least pre-injury status um, is your mindset. So remember, those clients are going to be all different. They are going to be um, athletes or non-athletes. They're going to be people that are older. You're going to have to adapt every single one of your programs or exercises and your principles to that client. So having a recipe of exercise, okay, I've got this, got all these great exercises from Tim and, and I've learned on this course all the rotator cuff work and I'm going to do that. If you do that with every single client, you're going to get unstuck. And you probably already know this, but you know, it's about learning the exercise and learning, okay, now how do I regress that? And I've got the principle of what I need to do. She, Sharon needs external rotation in her shoulder. Okay, she needs that. We work that out. She's lost the range. She's lost strength and she's had that, you know, cuff injury for ages. She needs that external rotation back where she's not going to get it. But she can't do the level I'm going to give her. So I need to know from the external rotation, where do I go as far as regressing it or increasing or sidestepping depending on what Sharon needs and what Sharon can cope with, okay? And how many times a week is she going to be doing it? And what's realistic for her? You know, can I give her two exercises? Can I give her eight, All right? Will she do eight? You know, or do I give her eight and split up during the week? And this is the sort of things we're going to sort of go through about, not necessarily what exercises, but the principle behind what, what we want to achieve. And remember, these patients that you're dealing with, they're not just, um, you know, patients that you need to get out of pain, you have to get, well, to get them out of pain, you're going to have to progress that exercise. So you might start that Sharon on a certain level of external rotation, and you've got to progress that up to get her stronger. Otherwise, she will not progress fast enough, and then she will feel like she's not doing well. Um, and, you know, if, if you don't progress that patient fast enough, they might sort of, get, you might get them out of pain with those exercises, but if you don't keep them on the bus and, and get them understanding why you're doing the exercises. It's like, okay, we need to get you stronger and we set these goals. 
they will probably stop, like I said before, when I mean, the pain's gone and then stop the exercises and then regress. And then they'll get sore again. Then they come back three months later, hopefully, that they still trust you and say, oh, I'm still in pain. I don't think those exercises work. And then they think those exercises aren't working. So it's very important that, you know, the principal part of these things is making sure those exercises are progressed, but progressed in the right way. Um, and is there, you know, what she's presenting with their movement pattern problem, is that related to their injury? You know, just because Sharon's got a winging scapula, does that really mean she that needs to be fixed? Is that really a priority? If you see a winger scap, you think, oh, I must I must do some scap presses to fix that or whatever the, the myriad of scap presses I've learned. Does she really need that? Or is it something else that's going on? And she had that forever and she's got a new injury or does she actually nearly need to fix that to get over a problem? So it is very important that you, you make sure you're doing, you're thinking about the principle behind what I need to achieve that point and then selecting exercise, like principles first, exercise second, rather than just dumping in exercises and just do this exercise and, and hoping that person gets better, work out what they need. We also know in saying that when, when we do exercise program in our clinic, um, we do have set rehab programs that help guide us. So most of you, like you probably understand with an ACL program, there are exercises that need to be done. And so, you know, you, if you've had a hamstring graft, you can't get away without strengthening up your hamstrings. You know, you need to be doing stability exercises for that ACL. You need to be doing all sorts of things and glutes. And there's a whole myriad of stuff. And because it's so complex, it needs to be set at a program. And it needs to be time-based because they're all, you know, they've got a surgical time frame as well. So sometimes it does, there is a, the principle is, hey, you need to follow this program and you need to do these exercises. And you're, you know, you're tackling or you're, a uh, hurdle will be trying to actually get all these, these people doing all these exercises and how long are you going to keep them on board for? Um, so that is tough. But in saying that, when you have set programs, do I need to get John, who's 65, you know, bounding and hopping when he is not doing any of those things? All he does is walking. Does he need to get back to pre-injury status? So I'm following my ACL rehab program or my lumbar spine disectomy program or my shoulder reconstruction program, but how far do I take that person? And you may find that some people have to take the nth degree again because they're, they're playing basketball, they're doing something, and you really have to extend your scope and get, you know, learn how to do a box jump and rotate because you have to teach that person how to do it and you have to do it well um, rather than just giving them exercise. Whereas some people you won't be doing that. So those set programs, those set um, guides, if you like, are there to guide you, but you may find you have to adapt within that program. Okay, I'm not doing that exercise or I'm doing the regression version of that exercise. So it's also about learning, okay, I've got a lunge, but there might be 10 different versions of that that I can adapt and change depending on that person. So that's going to be quite important. Acute pain injury phase. Um, this, I think, is one of the... I don't know if you guys have done this, but I think this is was a game changer for me as far as I had my acute pain treatment when we you know you get stuck and geez, I've done three sessions. You know, to be point, I've done three sessions with this person. I haven't really taught them any rehab yet. They're still in pain. Some people have to do that. Like they're just so in pieces and they they need they need just as much hands-on as far as rehab. Well, you haven't got time. We'll talk about time in a minute in the clinic, but um, you have to go and change that idea about treatment. I need to learn exercises to get them out of pain because some people, and I'm sure many of you have this before, especially with lower backs, you get them on the table and the more you touch them, the worse they get. Okay, you're massing that and then they can't get off the table and then you're, excuse my French, but you're screwed at that point because you go, what am I going to do with this person? Because... I've just spent half an hour thinking that massage was the best thing for them and releasing their QL, mobilizing their back and trying to get the extension better. And they're now worse. And now they're locking up and they're going to spasm. And you need to find exercises that will get them out of that and learn that and spot that time that comes in. And now we've, we, we've sort of getting pretty good at that. It's like, ah, John's come in and I have seen this before. I'm going to just make sure I don't stuff that up and put them straight in the bed and start getting into them and, and making them worse. And the more you sort of work out, okay, what exercises do give them pain relief, you'll, you'll realize that importance of doing 
exercise early in your sessions to make a massive difference to that person. And when they go, uh, say I will give someone, you know, they're locking up, they're not doing anything, and I'll go, okay, we're going to do bird dogs now, we're going to do some knee floats, and we're going to do a little bit of very gentle plank, and all of a sudden I've just activated their core a little bit, got their back out of spasm, and then they start bending forward, and they go, oh, oh, that's, that feels better. And I say, see, I didn't, I didn't touch you. You know, we just did a few exercises, and you're a bit better. And sometimes that's quite helpful. One, the, they're on board the exercises straight away. They just saw the exercises and made them better, not the treatment, okay? So they're going to go home and do their exercises. But also what happens is they then will be sort of at that point where um, realizing that their pain is not all about their injury because they, especially the people that have come up with a massive they come armed with the MRI scans. I've got, I've got this disc bulge and legitimately that disc bulge is pushing on one of their nerves and they have got pain. But not all their pain is from that. They've got muscle spasm, which is you're not going to you know, magically heal them up. You've got to get them out of spasm. And to teach them that not all their pain is injury drops that fear factor. And then if they are more inclined to do the exercise at home, knowing that, listen, if I do these stretches, I get out of pain because not all my pain there's my injury, my big injury that I'm so fearful about. It's actually muscle spasm. That's a component. I can start fixing that myself. Then they'll start getting better. And then they come back in improved. And that, you know, will, you know, you'll seem like a bit of a hero at that point, but it's going to enable you to, okay, now we can do some massage work because you do need a bit of loosening up there because you are very tight. And that will help you on your journey. But we're also in our session going to do all your exercises as well. And if you can move from sort of the activation exercises and getting those those muscles that are so sort of almost in spasm and, you know, not, not working is not a very good word, but, but as far as the brain concerned, it doesn't want to know. And so, you know, you, they are struggling to switch things on to get themselves better. Then moving from that and then into the strengthening phase, if you can bridge that little gap there and, and learn how those exercises progress into those movement patterns, then that's going to be a massive game changer to your rehab in the first two sessions. Um, and yes, it does mean they are going to be doing some homework hope and they're going to get better without you, but that is the idea. You want that person improving. You know, if you see them today, Monday, and you're not going to see them till Friday because you're chockers or maybe it's next week because you're fully booked because you've done so well as a physio, what are they going to do for seven days? Because if all the treatment was a few leg size that is not going to last them and you haven't taught them what to do, they're just going to get worse again and they're going to spend four days in pain. And that's not a very good outcome as a physio. We need to be trying to give them things to do so they come back saying, that really helped me this week. I feel heaps better. You know, I'm not 100% of course and I need more treatment and I need to... And we go, great, we can progress those exercises. And that will, you know, just keep that person progressing forward as, as quickly as you can. Of course, it's a little bit different, but um, those exercise that you do, the selection of them is going to be quite crucial early on. And that's what you'll learn on. And when when I've got I've got courses that we'll go through later, but that's the sort of stuff you're going to learn exactly what exercises do, what stuff you haven't learned before, something that's going to help you in all the areas from um, doing the acute phase right through to the strengthening phase and bridging that gap all the way through. Because it's especially important in those, you know, we could talk to people who say, I'll go back to lumbar spine again, but they're locked up on the bed. You know, if they can't do a glute bridge, you know, you say, well, you know, you've got this, I need to do a glute bridge because I want you, you know, to do hip extension. We've got to try and get folks away from the back. But if they can't even do a glute bridge, what are you going to regress that to to keep still getting them better if you find that all you know is a glute bridge? So it's very important that you know you have a big toolbox around that. Um, so, um, the other thing too is, you know, we talked about how that person now believes perhaps that they are not all their pain is, um, injury. At the same time, you've also given them sort of educate that client on not all their, uh, usual clinical reasoning about why you're doing those exercises. They've got to have a, come away from, or come away saying, I know why I'm doing these exercises because the six exercises, the six exercises, this. and that comes down to you know what that exercise actually does. Um, but make sure you convey that to your client. Don't just send them home with exercises. Like, do this, 
They go, why? You know, like, oh, it's going to make you better. They need to, the more they understand, the more you can educate that client, the more they're on, I find, the more they're on board. Um, and that will get them doing their homework. Because again, the secret is them getting them doing their homework. Um, so you've got to make sure that they, they go home with that. At the same time, they find those alternatives to their routine. You know, it's not just the rehab program success. It's not just about these amazing exercises that you're getting everyone doing. It's also about um, finding alternatives and or telling them what not to do. You know, what shouldn't they be doing? And that comes as part of the components we talk about later on. What shouldn't they be doing, which will actually make them better? If they stop doing some things um, without stopping doing all exercise, um, how is that going to help improve them? So you give them those things, because there's no point you give them those exercises and they go home and they, you know, they haven't stopped sitting if they've got a, you know, a disc problem or they haven't, you know, stop certain movement pads that is going to going to injure them you know if they're a runner you know, okay we need to be get you on the bike and little things that we take is for like oh that's just well that's just makes sense they need to hear that they need to know and they need to be given all those alternatives and and different things of doing the same routine if you like so they can keep moving keep doing their exercises when you go to chronic um, this is going to be a little bit different. You need to understand the difference between what exercise you're going to do or what exercise you're going to use for an acute person for, to a chronic injury phase because we get both those types of people and all the people in between the acute and the chronic um, because you may find that the exercises, they're going to be um, maybe tolerating more as far as they're a bit stronger perhaps because they're not in the acute phase. They might be a bit weaker because they've been conditioned for so long. Um, so you've got to think, oh, what does what is the chronic pain patterning going to do um, to that person's movement patterns? Is it, you know, have they had back pain for so long that their glute medius has now been smashed with pain and it's actually really tight and it's not very strong? And that's why their knee is rolling in. And so you need to sort of focus on up the chain what exercise I'm going to do for this person. It may not just be that oh, I need to get their extension better and I, I also need to work on all sorts of things like maybe their glute need needs to be improved and down the chain, up the chain and trying to work on strength and enhanced movement in the chronic people rather than perhaps the range movement, the pain relief that you worked on the acute people. Because these people have gone through some just deconditioning stages, the, you know, your exercise is going to have to adapt and change um, and sometimes these people, you may have to actually go back to uh, do basics with them. You might have to go, okay, you need to do, you know, actually you, you, you're really strong, but you actually need your, your deep core work is no good. Or listen, your, your quads are great. You know, you've done really well with that, but you're still getting knee pain because you're, hip stability is out and you know or your hip strength is out and so your knees are you know not tolerating the walking even though your quads are so good could be the other way around because they have cracker glutes and their their quads are really weak so you've got to work out exactly what has happened to that client person and make sure that you are your program or your exercise are addressing those components um as good as you possibly can and remember some people are going to be very skeptical about you know, if they've seen that they're a chronic person there and they've maybe skipped about exercise because they've been given so many exercises before, your job is to work out, well, okay, what exercise have you done? What hasn't worked for you? And don't go down the same route of just because they've got this and this wrong, if that hasn't worked for them, you've got to find alternatives. And that's where your, your toolbox is going to be quite important. What I want you to uh, look at is when you do... I'm just going to suss out the screen here. When you do exercise and treatments, okay, um, I believe if you're going to do, you know, a QL relief, I'm talking about lower backs. So I've had so many lower back people today. If you do QL release for someone and that makes them feel heaps better, okay? So you're going, okay, I just loosened up their lower back i have done my manual theory because that really helped you've got to be thinking but i need the time to be able to give them these people this person exercise and hopefully you've got like an hour for your initial consult 
maybe 45 minutes of your follow-up. That'd be great, you say. You know, I've only got half an hour, I've only got 20 minutes. You're not going to get treatment and exercise instruction done in half an hour if it's a big case. It's not going to happen. And so you've got to work out, well, do I need to see this person more times per week? And I'm not doing this to try and, and I'm not coming down to clinic owners to say, hey, you need to be doing longer treatment sessions. But and I'm also not trying to say, hey, you need to make lots of money by seeing these people. But if you do not get that person in for that second session and do some exercise on that, it's going to be very hard for you to keep them on board. You're going to have to get that treatment done in that session. Usually that's why we have an hour, but we've got to look at our clock and go, that QL release I just did, that really worked for them. They, they are heaps better. We'll give that to them for homework, okay? Give them an exercise that mimics what you do. If what you did in the clinic worked, give them something to do at home. Admittedly, you can do that much better with mobility exercises, I feel, than you can with strength and exercises, of course. Um, so, you know, if you are loosening something up, give them something that sort of mimics that thing. If you get, if it's a QL thing, give them a QL stretch, okay? Get that release going. But at some point, you're going to have to switch from the mobility to the strengthening part. And usually, we're always sort of going for that mobility first for some reason. I think it's because of days gone by. But it's also, it's the first thing you're going to do to replicate what you just did in the clinic manually. So that's okay. Um, some of you will have, you know, maybe the expertise to go, I don't even touch that client anymore. I think sometimes you do if to get that personal touch and, and sometimes not all strengthening work you're going to do in your gym area is going to fix some 100% as if you did treatment as well. So just be careful of that. But try to make sure that you do have that time in your session to, one, write a program, and God forbid you do it afterwards, then send it to them, or two, actually teach them what they're doing. What are they doing today, day one, um, for homework, or at least are they coming back on Thursday and you can teach them it then? And is Thursday from today, is Thursday when you get them back in, just rehab. So if, the, if, this, if this first session was assessment and treatment and uh, oh, should have run out of time, okay, Thursday, listen, Richard, you are coming back in on Thursday. This is the whole, give them a reason why they're coming back. Okay, you're not, you know, you're coming on Thursday because we need to go through all those exercises to get them better. But in saying that, if they sort of like, oh, but I don't, I haven't been proved that exercise has fixed me yet, you know, you need to make sure that you, this is what I'm saying, get it done the first session, at least touch on it to get them a bit of homework and then we're going to go through it on Thursday. And then hopefully by Thursday, you've got them on board with that rehab and then you can keep going. Okay, and start pushing it along a little bit further. So those longer, session times are going to be crucial to your success it's a, it's been a game changer from us i came from a clinic in 19 when did I start? 1998 we were doing 15 minute sessions right we had three people rotating on a bed it was just ridiculous i got a bonus if i saw 100 people in a week like that's out of control right times have changed and i've decided and there's a clinic and i'm going that's not happening again that made a lot of money of course, but our outcomes were crap. And so when I look back on it, did we get them better enough? Well, yes, we had, I was in New Zealand, so we had ACC, it was just paying for it so people could come back. If you're in a clinic where I am in, in Bono Junction, rough part of the neighborhood at the moment, um, if you're in a clinic like this, our rent is high, our practitioners get paid well, we charge a lot, okay? So those people that are coming in, they are getting charged quite a lot for an hour and three quarters an hour, and prices going up everywhere. They, ex I think now they expect some decent quality treatment. And you, know, you need to make sure you are getting those longer sessions, but you're putting some amazing stuff inside those longer sessions. Once you get those longer sessions and you're charging a bit more, I'm not trying to give you an education on business, but you'll find that that week is so much better for all your, your patients will start getting better faster. You'll get a better name for yourself. Oh, that's important. But at the end of the day, your patients are getting better rather than just coming back and they're going, oh, I'm not so much better and you're feeling a bit crap about it. So make sure you get that in there. Educate them around that fear of, of pain and exercise they are doing it um, straight away and they're getting better in between sessions. You know, you, you give them exercise, they get better between visits. Um, at the end of the day, what that'll do is start reinforcing those good motor patterns, those you know, those effort messages that are going to start getting that person 
out of pain, desensitizing, and improving their overall injury. Okay. So let's talk about if we are using exercise and treatments, what do we do about selection? Okay, how are we going to get, you know, what am I going to choose? If I've got, you know, patellofemoral pain and someone comes in and again, I've got, I've got this pain underneath my knee, it's going to, of course, have to start with your rock solid assessment. That is, you know, one thing if, if you know, I think we were, we came out of university now with my first year where our assessment was pretty damn good. I think it's 10 times better now because I've been a practitioner for longer. Um, but I think definitely the assessment part, if you if you don't have that right, if you're not looking at that person from a biomechanical point of view instead of just the injury, um, then you won't do as well with your exercise or select the right exercise. Because many people have this toolbox of exercises and then are just doing a bit of guesswork. Okay, and anyone can go, you know, on a course like mine and go, oh, these are the exercises, great, but how do I apply it based on my assessment? Your assessment has to be that that good, and it's not just, oh, what tissue they injured, and it's not necessarily, if that's injured like a fall, or the fall did it, but <laughs> biomechanically, what is now holding them back that's going to limit them getting back from that injury, okay? So if they have gone into an injury with average knee stability, perhaps that's a telephemoral problem. They've gone into that injury, they fell over, now they're injured, and they've also got some other stuff going on. You hit a wall at some point. So you may start off with the injured area, but then your, your job is to make sure you take care of everything else that is going to affect that injury, because now they've got, you know, they're even worse now because they've got something else going on. So your assessment is going to be crucial to that. And that'll give you a lot more scope to start going, okay, hey, I'll just pick out a name, Tom. <laughs> you know, you come with this injury, but I've noticed you've got this and this going wrong. We're not going to do that today, but we need to address that before you start running again. So what I want you working on is these exercises. We're going to get that getting really good, and that's going to take some of your pain away. But then before we start returning doing that journey of returning to running, we really have to address your ability, your core stability, and flexibility. That hip is not great, and that glute med that you know is not very good, or whatever that muscle you're dealing with. Um, we're going to address that. And what that will do is set them up to go, okay, I'm coming in for this. I'm going to progress to that. And so you, you're already giving them a sort of bit of a roadmap of, I'm going to see you eight times or 10 times, whatever it is. Let's just focus on the first two weeks because a lot of people can't contemplate coming in eight or 10 times, especially financially until they see the results with you. And then they they get to that point where they are happy to chuck money in because you're making them better. That you know, money doesn't become a problem anymore. And then you're going, yay, I can actually get this person better. Um, but just get them focusing on that first, you know, one or two sessions with some great exercises to prove that you're getting better. And then you need to progress them through. And then you've got to, you, your job is to then select exercises that are now different, okay? And they move on. You might still keep some in there, um, and you're using your guides of your program, but you then progress on to different things um, to fix everything in that client. And you're not going to have to do this to do everybody, when, but when you spot that person that is you know is going to break down again with running because of that new injury or whatever that sport they're doing, it's your job to make sure you address that. And that will give you a, another reason for them to come back and you get that problem, problem really, really good. Um, it may also be that could be the other way around. That person is coming with knee pain because their hip is terrible and they are loading up and they're doing the Sydney Marathon in a few weeks and they are getting pain because they haven't addressed their week, whatever. Um, their pain's down their knee, but you know it's problems further up and you've got to start working on that. And it's about making sure you, you choose the right exercises day one to get into the point where they are then progressing forward well and not choosing the wrong one. So, when I say, you know, you know, when you or when you see an injury start off, don't always choose the level one exercises. Don't always go, not everyone is going to need clamps as their first thing they do for hips. Okay. You might find, yeah, but they got weak glutes, but not everyone is going to need that sort of work. Okay. Some people will go straight into something. Some people will go straight into, okay, they've got, you know, they're significantly really good in their knee. They might go straight into a single leg squat with a band. You know, because that fires up or a one leg ball squat where they're firing up their glute med really, really well. They don't need to do the clamp up. They need to actually do 
loading work on their feet. So make sure you're not falling to that trap either. It's like, we did start at level one and we'll progress to level two, level three, and four. other people will be different. And some people may not tolerate the clams. Or they come and go, I've been doing clams. So you have to move them on to something else. You might come back to that and fix their clams if they're not doing very well. But it might be, a, you might have to sidestep with some people just to get them on the rehab bus. Okay, you can do this exercise without pain. We'll give you some fun stuff. And then we'll come back to that and tie it out later. Um, and so making sure that, you know, you're also thinking about, um, am I doing like proximal work before the distal work, right? There's no point really doing the distal stuff on a limb so much if the proximal work is, is not great. You know, what I mean by that is they have got, you know, chronic pain going through their shoulder from a, say, rotator cuff tear, and you know that that supraspinase and their infraspinase is rubbish, um, but they've developed from that pain a really unstable scapula. You know, getting that person 100% through rotator cuff work alone is, you know, you need to be thinking, what's the best thing to do here? Do I do low-level work in their rotator cuff and sort of more high-level work in their scapula because they're not injured in their scapula. They're injured in their rotator cuff, so they may not be able to tolerate too much load in that tendon, but they can tolerate a lot of stuff in that scapula. And I can really focus on the scapular work um, and that, okay, they're improving now in their scapular control, right? And I'm fixing that up at the same time I'm getting their rotator cuff work done. Not trying to do rotator cuff and waiting, waiting, waiting. And then, oh, shit, now we need to do your scapular work. Making sure that gets in early doors. And you may find you can do so much work with someone that actually improves them as well. You know, you may find them just physically getting their shoulder blade more stable actually improves their symptoms in their shoulder when they are lifting things and moving and putting things in the dishwasher and reaching up in the cupboard. The pain wasn't all just about their rotator cuff, it was everything else. So you'll find that, you know, by thinking about what exercise you're going to select, okay, to fix their problem, you actually improve them more by doing all the right things at the right time. And then it also then comes down to what level or progression am I going to start with and then move them to. And we'll, we'll talk about the progression method in a minute, you know, finding what alternatives can I give them if, okay, this person doesn't have this equipment at home. I still want to do that exercise because that's really going to be really good for them. How do I find alternatives for them? So they're not guessing themselves. You have to then take that exercise, work out what they can't do at home, and then try and adjust it. Some people are like, they might be, oh, I go to the gym. Oh, have they given you this, this, and this in the gym? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Well, we're going to do that with, with you. You know, but if you're giving someone to do some balance work on a BOSU in the gym, that's great. But if they haven't got a BOSU at home, what are they going to do? You know, so you're going to have to work out how you're going to adapt. You don't just not do an exercise. You're going to have to adapt the variations and work on those alternatives. Um, and making sure that, you know, when you do give all those exercises, you know, how many are you giving? Um, I do fall into the trap still, and I have a bad rap in this clinic, but girls give me, give me a bit of grief about giving too many exercises for clients. I get, I get carried away. And I go, I've got to fix this person. They've got so many things wrong. I've got to give them some exercise. And they come back and they go, I've had a really busy week and things have been going on and baby's sick. And I haven't done all those exercises. So I just did, I just did the first three. I'm going, they're not the they're not the three, they're not the most important three, Sharon. And go, oh, I just went from one, two, and three. I just did the first three, and then I ran out of time. And again, I didn't put them in the right order. I didn't tell them what was priority. I didn't realize that, yeah, if they can't do all of them, what ones do I want to get them done first? So you may have to be very careful about what well, I find. I catch myself all the time about, okay, well, work out what this person's life is like. Can they handle, you want to give them six? Can they handle six? Or are you going to split them three on Monday, three on Tuesday? Tell them what to do. Tell them they're doing these three on Monday and these three on Tuesday. And if you only get to two, I want you doing these. And put them in order, you know, if you've got an app to do that. Um, or just write it down, you know, I want you to do these ones and these ones. They need that instruction because a lot of people at those times, they're, they're very busy and they're very full. Um, and they need that instruction to tell them exactly what exercises that you selected are going to be the most important for that week or that day. Um, because otherwise, you know, you're going, oh my God, I'm back to square one again, and you have to start again. 
So um, let's move on from exercise selection. Let's go through and look at the next little bit. I'm just going to show you this. There we go. I've got two screens here. Now, this is taken directly out of my course that I'm doing. Uh, I've got no, this sounds, sounds really silly There's and really simple, but I put it down into progressions of mobility and strengthening. Okay, and this is the way I think you guys should be thinking globally or generally about how am I going to progress and exercise through? Okay, so if you're thinking about mobility side of things, you should be thinking, okay, range of movements sits on the left. And then I'm going to be looking at, okay, maybe more lengthening the stretching work. And then to progress that, maybe I'm going to use some power bands or distraction or something else to affect that joint. The same time, if I'm going to use devices, what am I going to start with? You know, what's What's more broad, maybe it's a foam roller sort of thing that you're going to use as just examples of what tools you might use given the homework. Maybe I'm going to work on some trigger point ball release. Remember, this is the stuff that is mimicking what you're doing in the clinic. And then it might give them a bit of a combo. There's not too many progressions that happen in mobility. There's more about strengthening. So if you took, say, an injury from, you know, the cold face, if you like, you know, where they are broken, you might be thinking this person, all they can do is tolerate is isometrics. This, this, you know, their rotator cup tendon needs some strengthening. It needs some activation. If they get some isometric work done, their pain reduces. Okay, so this is that's the, on the left hand side of the spectrum. But again, like I said before, you're not going to start everybody at level one in the isometric phase. They might be past that. If they are, I'll just bring that up again. If they are um, a surgical case. And they're sitting at, you know, if it's a shoulder surgery, and you know, the first thing they're going to do, their rotator cuff work is going to be isometric. You are not going to be doing band work with them um, when they are out of their sling. They won't, one, they won't be able to tolerate it. Two, they haven't passed their time frame. And so you're going to be doing isometric work with them. But then, you know, that strengthening is then going to movement. All right. So how do I get this person moving without putting any load on them? because they can't tolerate any load, but I do need to get them moving. I need to get them out of pain, I get those muscles working so that joint feels better. And then my thing is, you get to the point, okay, you've done isometric, where you've done movement, where do I go from there? And nine times out of 10, it may not be nine, but I go for stability before load. Okay, so joint stability before adding load onto that joint. Can I work on exercises if they're moving and they're doing work and they're doing pushes and pulls, before I start going, oh, we need to progress this and we need to push you up a level because you're getting better, is put load on. Okay, what I want to do is challenge that shoulder, that hip, that knee, that ankle, your lumbar spine. With stability options first, you get more engagement of muscles wrapping around a joint before I start adding on shear load or compression load. And, and to be honest, the compression load will probably come first before the shear load and certain things. But if you, this is a sort of crucial one. This is the point where I think a lot of practitioners get stuck. And if you can remember anything from today, <laughs> it's try and aim for stability options first in your program. You'll see when I show you the, the next slide, before load options, okay? And then because once you're the load options, you're away. Okay, you get, yeah, they fixed up that their knee doesn't wobble inwards when they do a single leg squat, then you're allowed to load it. If you start load, and, and you'll sort of go, yeah, I sort of get that. If they're doing a single leg squat and you load them up with weight, it's probably going to make their pain worse, just like the run would. So you've got to think, I've got to try and fix that movement pattern problem, then stability problem, then I'm allowed to add load, and then I can start going ballistic with them as far as giving that to conditioning and return. And maybe that might be a combination of ex of movement pads. It might be a squat because you've done some single leg work and now you're working on a full squat and loading it up. And then they might be jumping, you know, impact work. So that last sort of stage, everything has to be sorted by the time you get there. That should guide you in how you're going to progress or regress an exercise, make an exercise difficult, make it more unstable, make it more challenging, make it more difficult. So if we put that into... Uh, let me do this. If we go and put that into an example, 
here is an example for it. So this is the flow chart sort of thing. I mean, we don't do this with patients. This is taken straight out of my knee course. This is one of the many exercises that I get people doing, okay? And what we do, is, and, and I am talking about that course a little bit, but what we do say on the course is we start, okay, let's learn the step down. Now, I've coined that the step down. I don't know if that was me that did that, but it's a single leg squat, but it's not a single leg squat with your knee going forward. That's another story. It's a single leg squat with your knee going backwards. So if we can, if that's like, it's not level one, it's about level two and a half, if you like, if we call that our base exercise, the step down, what is our movement forward, back, regression, stability, load options from that point? And so if they can nail a step down, if your control is that good, so meaning if your knee control, they're tracking beautifully, okay, and you go, geez, you're doing really well with that, how do I increase that what are my stability options for that so if you look at straight across into the s okay the stability option the first thing we're going to get them doing is putting a band load on them that challenges them okay so it's making that more unstable so they are now learning to do a step down with better control that their hip is getting forced to do more work to control the knee so it's harder for them, but I've not put any more load down on that knee. Okay, so if it's a meniscal problem, ACL problem, telefemoral wall problem, I've not put any more vertical load down on that. It's not harder from a quads and joint point of view, it's harder from a hip point of view. Okay, and sometimes this is quite good if, to teach people sort of, okay, you, you're quite good at that step down, but we need to push you a little bit further. The second stability option, right? So that first one is using a band. I don't know if you can see that very well. The second option would be, okay, let's make the foot more unstable by putting out you on a bow suit. Okay, so we're changing that stability option. You might be going all the way through that and go from you know getting all that stability right. Now that now that now I can come back and put some load on. Okay, because I've and you may find, I find a lot of the time. It's the stability component that gets rid of most of their pain, not the load component, okay? The load component might get them strong enough to run and therefore when they are doing loading work, when they are running, they've got more strength and they stop getting pain then. But we're talking about going downstairs and you know walking for long periods and, and doing step busts and stuff. If they've got pain with that, you probably find if you work on the stability option first, you basically almost give them out of pain at that point there, okay? then the loading stuff's really easy. And if they, you know, if I bring this back again, if you look at that load component uh, there on that bottom one with the red L, there's my load component, they're all kettlebells. But this is where you go, they go, oh, I don't go to the gym. I've got no kettlebells at home. Oh, have you got any of those bands? Yeah, 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 I've got power bands. Okay, there's your alternative. So you're adding load with different things. And this may, I mean, sometimes I tell people they roll their eyes, and of course, but patients don't know that. You know, you've got to give these options, like how do I get this person loaded up to get them stronger, but they don't go to the gym, okay? And so they're not going to buy $50 kettlebells for home, okay? They're going to, they may be going to use their band or use whatever they've got. Maybe they could hold something else. Um, at the same time, You've got to have regression. Well, you don't have to do the exercise, but that person that needs to do a step down because they walk downstairs and walk upstairs, it's a functional movement, but they have telephemoral pain. They can't even do a step down. Then you need regression options. So what I mean by that is um, you need to have, if that person can, they have pain, say, on a single spot where their knee is going forward, all right, and they're getting pain. Now you need to know and learn what am I, how am I going to regress that a bit so I can still do most of that movement pan and get most of those muscles working and get that them doing something that is getting a little stronger without the pain. Okay, and a lot of the time, say, so patellofemoral pain, our first regression would be don't let that knee travel forward. I still want you to do a single squat, but instead of that knee translating forward, which you can't tolerate at the moment because every time you do that, it causes pain and that's not going to work for you. I'm going to get you doing 
more work go backwards. So they might be still bending their knee and now teaching their brain that they need to do knee flexion. Um, but at the same time, they're getting more hip work done. So at least that they're doing is more hip work, less knee work until they get enough strength to maybe control that. And it's quite surprising how, you know, you will see someone do a, if I go back to that screen, you see someone do a full squat um, on two legs and they're totally fine. And then you get them in a single leg squat and they instantly have knee pain. Those people um, need to be shown regression positions like you see up, I mean, the worst one is just maybe static loading, which is the top one. But if you look at that regression one that is um, sort of up and around, that is more hip flexion, less knee for translation. And the regression from that, so like is using or deloading that person. So if that person's body weight, they cannot even bend their knee under load, but they can do a full squat. You're going, what is going on there? It is clearly all about single leg stability and single leg loading. Then you need to maybe deload that person. So we will get someone doing a single leg squat if they've got a bar, great, right? maybe a bench, where they put weight through, say, a bar or a bench, and they unload themselves. So relatively what's happening is that knee has less load on it. And all of a sudden, and you're, I beg you to go and do this with some of your knee clients and test this yourself. And part of the thing is testing, you know, say exercise like this, is get them doing a single leg squat and taking all the weight through, say, a bar and taking the weight out of that knee. How far forward can they push that knee? Right, they've still got a bit of load through it. Um, but can they do a normal movement pattern that they could not do if they had their full body weight on it? Because we all assume that everyone can tolerate their body weight. So it's like, well, how do I, we always put weight on, but how do we take weight off? Okay. And so taking weight off is putting two feet on the ground. That's why they can do a squat, right? They can do a squat and they can do it with, because they're sharing load between one leg and the other, but they still got to walk downstairs. So you need to then put them back on one leg, but unload them just like a two-legged squat will do and get that body used to those movement pants. And then you can build and re progress backwards. You're going from regression. Can I get them doing it without a bar? Then I can get it, can I them do a normal one with the knee going forward? Then I can add stability to a load and away you go. Okay. So this progression method idea is designed to take an exercise of all the hundreds of exercises and increase your toolbox by regressing or increasing load and doing different things to get them doing almost the same movement and that allows you to not have to jump hurdles because many people get stuck on I'm doing this exercise they're getting pain with all the time and if someone's going home and they're doing pain every time they do it they're going to stop doing it okay and how are you going to get that person being able to do a single leg squat if you haven't found out a way to get them doing it pain free Okay, that's the big take-home message. So if I take another um, example for you, so that's like, say, a single leg idea. If I give you another example uh, here, internal rotation. So now you're thinking, okay, internal rotation. And that's not just, say, oh, it says subscap. Say they've just got weakness in internal rotation. Okay, important stuff. Um there is all sorts of regression and different alternatives for that. They might just be doing band work here, the bog standard, I've got to do this. And this is really important that internal rotation of the band, when you're coming out of surgery, they need that's all they can do. They can't even raise their arm past, you know, 20, 30 degrees. So there's no point in doing it any higher. And they've got to, they can't externally rotate past 10. So they're just doing this little work in here, right? But when they um do isometric work, which is the, which is the uh, equal sign, they are not moving. So the regression would be, or the isometric version would be, okay, they are not moving during internal rotation. Progressive, that might be, okay, they do it behind their back, but they're still doing an isometric version of it behind their back. Um, the alternative to, say, the band load might be a dumbbell load. And then how do, and that also gives them a stability option because they've got to use their joint in space. Then they might progress because the progression is, okay, I am now doing it, instead of doing it here, I'm now progressing into range, which is going to be harder for them um, to do. And so it's going to be more complex. That's the thing. 
or the progression of the band might be, okay, the band's down here, now the band's up here, now the band's up here, now I'm doing movement patterns. And so you can take the principle of internal rotation, band work, and split it up into all sorts of things depending on what that person needs. Because the end goal is like, well, I need to get the internal rotation to better because they are a swimmer or they are chucking, they're a football player and they need to throw the ball. Well, we need to work on how, we, where does that person sit as far as what their capability is, as far as your internal rotation? And then, okay, where they are they in that progression part? And then do they go forward or backwards? All right. And so knowing that, you know, your internal rotation is not one exercise, there's maybe seven or eight or nine different things or options you can do is quite important because that gives you the progression week to week. Okay. You almost don't need to think about nine different exercises. You think of internal rotation and then apply the principles of stability, range of movement, what alternatives can I do? What load can I do? How do I progress the difficulty of that? on the path to throwing, okay, if that's what they need to do. You cannot expect someone to do internal rotation even here and just doing a little bit of light load and then going and playing ball sport or racket sport, okay? It has to progress. This principle will give you that idea and that option. So if we now look at, I'll give you another option for you. Again, it's taken straight, that was out of my shoulder course. Uh, this one, where is this one? Okay, so love this one. Very old pictures, so I need to update these pictures. Um, here's a side plank, right? So one of McGill's amazing exercises, if you follow McGill, side plank, fantastic. Okay, for static strength, lateral static strength, amazing. I find people do this, they do so much better with their lower backs. Um, say if we do a side plank on their knees, if we can get that person to a side plank on their knees, Okay, where do, I, where do I need to go from there? If they can't do it, how do I regress that? Do I give them an option where I'm actually not all on the ground? Maybe I'm up on a bench, maybe I'm just on a wall. Okay, how do I get that person doing something that resembles a side plank? Maybe they can't tolerate the load when they're on the ground. Maybe it's their shoulder. Okay, maybe they've got a really weak shoulder. You need to, you're fixing their back and you need to get them doing Side planks, but they can't tolerate for their shoulder. So what are you gonna what are you gonna work on? Now these sort of options um, progress in a way that you know. Think of like a side plank is on their knees, so therefore that's a short lever. The most sensible thing was maybe increase that to a long lever. Okay, and then do I add a stability component? Meaning, do I add a rotational movement to them? Do I add an anti rotation if they're in a full side plank? Do I then need to go and work on some pulling and some pushing work in that side plank to generate more work rate done in their core, if you like, depending on what they need. I had, I know his name, I had a cyclist in here today and part of it, he's moved from side planks on his feet to side planks pulling a band and pushing a band. And the reason I'm doing that is because he's on his bike He's, he has had a disectomy and he's on his back on his bike. He does, this guy does five hour rides, like it's full on. Um, he's not up to five hours yet. We're just trying to get him back, you know, on the bike and doing at least an hour. Um, but he sent a video of me on his bike. And of course, his hands on the handlebars and said, and he's, there's so much movement at the moment between his upper body and his lower body. So every time he's pushing and pulling, uh, pushing and pulling, pushing and pulling with his legs, okay. The fourth generation, because he's got strong legs, is creating a lot of work in his spine. And because of his back problem, he's lost his strength in his, his sort of trunk, if you like. So there's way more movement than he should be. And he's commented like, I feel like I'm moving too much on the bike. Yeah, because you lost your strength. Now, giving him side planks, static, is gonna, gonna do half the job. I need to get that person, he's strong, good, but you're still moving. I need to get something that replicates. This is almost like we talked about replicating stuff in the clinic. How can you get an exercise that almost replicates what they are doing in sport? Okay, so like an ACL, I need to get you jumping, hopping, and twisting. What am I going to get for a cyclist to stop them twisting on his bike? Right? And this is where the principles of like, well, add some stability options to that. Okay, so what I'm now doing is, okay, he's pushing and pulling in, in a side plank. 
And I showed him that, you know, and I had to learn how I did it myself, right? So I have to be good at doing a side plank and push ball. Otherwise, how the hell is he going to learn it? When I'm doing it, showing that, okay, if I pull that band and it wants to pull me that way, right? It's trying to rotate me. And he got the idea, the concept like that. When I showed him, can you see what the band's trying to do? So if you resist the band, you don't think about what muscles you use. You pull on the band, your brain does it. And I wanted you to learn that and pro program that into your body. So when you are on the bike, you don't have to think about it. It becomes more and more and more natural that every time you power through that left leg, you're stabilizing with your right hand side. And you're learning that sort of contralateral stability, if you like, that you, that you learned in a bird dog, and then you put strength on it with a side plank, and now you're doing some rotation work. And that sort of stuff, you almost can see sometimes the light bulb switch on in that patient, and they go, oh my God, I get that. And then they start working on it. And you, you can see the results as they as they start improving and start doing these guys, they just become more and more stable. And the results will come out going, you know, I feel way much better on the bike. I'm hardly moving at all. I don't have to think about it. So there's some options for you um, as far as what, how we try and progress things. So let's look at when you're writing that rehab program, you're putting it together. Um, let's bring this share the screen up again. Let's drill down what you need to be focusing on. Your focus areas in rehab should be number one, don't do what I do. No, don't give too many too soon. All right, that's that's we get excited and we get too many too soon. We have to have faith that they're not going to get bored doing the boring stuff, but we do have to progress it. But when you focus on that program, what do you what do you need to give that client? Do you need to give them pain reduction, mobility, joint range, muscle activation, movement control, ice strength? No, you don't. Okay. It may not always progress through. This is not a progression from start to finish of like, oh, I need to start them with some mobility and get their joints moving, then I can move to isometrics. You may, someone may come in and they are perfect joint range and move. They've got pain in their shoulder. They're loose as a goose, okay? They're hypermobile. Am I going to give them mobility work to go home with? Am I going to start playing and stretching the crap out of their joint? No. They are have got pain because they're hypermobile and unstable. And he's maybe he's got a, you know, if you test him and he's got a label tear, well, I'm certainly not going to make him do more stretching. So you can't just follow a recipe that you're going to just give stretching to that person. That You've got to think that person needs, do they need strength? Yes, but what's their biggest problem? Stability, all right? So your stability, Stability exercises is probably the first thing you'd look at with that person, right? Those stability exercises give him strength, okay? So his strength is not just about the muscle strength, it's about how that joint is kept together. That's his strength, if you like. So the exercises are strengthening, they're just biased and the focus is joint control and stability. If you look at that exercise, you know, maybe it's a one arm scat press and a four point, it's strengthening his rotator cuff up to stabilize the joint. You're not going for external rotation strength and doing external rotation band. You're doing a joint control movement. So it's important that you know you do focus on what is the most important thing for this person. Some people come in, they're super strong, they just need more strength than external rotator cuff, and they might just need isolated muscle strength. And all they're doing is isolated work, and that's it's making them better. You know, do they need to do single side stuff versus, you know, bilateral? I'm a big one on single side and fixing that up before I start doing double work. You know, I always cringe when people come in and say, yeah, I've been doing my shoulder exercises and then, you know, they're doing this. So going, well, that's not going to teach you how to stabilize and do that. And they're just getting the concept wrong a little bit. Um, maybe they've just come in and they need their pads and movement are not so great. Maybe someone's come in and they're getting back, back pain because their whole deadlift technique is terrible. You know, they're doing the, that overload in their lower back. Their lower back, I've had people in here, won't well, name names, they are so strong in their lower back. Their muscles are massive and they're getting pain in their lower back because they're overloading it. I don't need to strengthen that person's lower back. I need to fix the way they are moving and stop them using their lower back all the time. And so that comes again, comes down to assessment. So 
what is my focus for that person? Patterns of movement. If I can't teach them what a good deadlift is, how am I going to change them? Because they're strong. Their core works. They have good hip range. They just do a really crap deadlift. And I need to be able to, you know, if they come in for help, if you can't correct that and teach them what to do, then you're going to get stuck. Um, and then, but also, is it sport specific work? Um, is it balance? Is it lateral load? What, what are you focusing on? So, once you've got those focus areas right, um, then if I bring this up here, then you know you also need to think when I select an exercise, there's also all this range of stuff that go into the exercise section. Sometimes those exercises are going to involve two things, which is going to go cool. I tick two boxes with that. I've got them right. Um, but try and think about this. Is what, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is, you know, you've got this toolbox of exercises, but always come back to the point of, okay, I'm selecting because of what? Okay, why am I selecting a four-point scapular press with arm raise and a band line? Why am I doing that? Is it because they're, you know, I just that's the natural progression or they're actually really good at that and I don't need to do that ever with them? Um, you know, we've had people in here with, you know, shoulder impingement, classic. No, I know a lot of people say, well, shoulder impingement, there is no shoulder impingement. They have had an ultrasound, they have got a blown up bursitis, and when they go under abduction, there is impingement there, and they've got a painful arc. They've got a shoulder impingement. And you think, and they do this, and they're going, they're really sore, and they've had it for three months, and you think, oh, I can't wait to see this person's scapula rhythm, you know, like they are going to be. They're going to be all over the shop. I just can't wait to see this this whole step. You go clunky, and they're perfect. And you go, how the hell does that work? Like, how do you get your arm up? Is that sore? Yes, yeah, it's really sore. And their scap control is just amazing. You're going, that doesn't make sense. Do I need to get that person doing scap work? No. Okay, I need to find a way to get rid of that impingement though. Okay, maybe it is doing mobility work with them. Okay, maybe they need an injection perhaps, but. You know, it does, it's not always you're going to work on just because this person got a certain type of condition, do they need to do every single thing? But at the same time, you've got to be very clear, of, you know, making sure you don't miss those exercises, okay? Have a look at those things. Have I covered everything? You know, if that person's not getting better, they've come into your clinic and they are not improving, or you get the point where you've done all these exercises and you go, ah, oh, Come back to those components. Have I missed anything out of here? What am I not doing? And it's usually the thing that they haven't been doing or you haven't been doing that is probably the first thing you need to look at. Is I go, yeah, geez, I haven't done any single side work with them or I haven't done any, I haven't fixed their moon pan on their humerus and that's why they're, or their skeptical humor rhythm, that's why they're not getting better. Um, so make sure you work on that. The second thing, or one of the last things, is uh, if I can just bring this up is your program structure. So when you've got you've all these great exercises, and this, you know, I think should be without question, but I believe a lot of practitioners are not doing this sort of stuff. They are treating the person, haven't got enough time to do much, and, and then send them home with some exercises. And all it is in that program is treatment and exercises, and that is it. Does that person, and I, I make sure my, my staff do this, does that person have a diagnosis of their injury written down for them. When someone asks them, you went with physio today, what they say was wrong with you? Can they effectively say, yes, the physio knows exactly what I'm going, I've got this, you know, telephemoral pain, it's because my blurred bar light, that you've written it down for them. They can remember it. Okay, they've got a diagnosis of condition. We put that in our online program that we built, we put that in the, we write, we pipe that in. It's a part of their program. They have a diagnosis and a condition. Okay. Even if you don't know half what's going on, something, you know, you've got a weak this or you've got pain here and it's because of, probably because of this. It doesn't have to be this full on crazy diagnosis. Yeah. All right. But they have to understand as part of your program structure, they have to understand what their problem is. If they don't understand, they're less likely to do all their homework, okay? Or why they're doing it. You need to also give them an overview, okay? What am I, I'll come back to the slide in a minute. What am I giving them as a, this is what the journey is gonna be, 
Okay, maybe you might have to do this in, in the second session. You go, I've got time for that, and put it all in an hour. Well, you have to do it at some point because if they know where they are going, if you're just saying, come back on Thursday, it's like, what for? You know, like, when, when, when can I play soccer? When, when, when am I doing this? Give them an idea of what you're trying to achieve. Okay, we're going to do this, this week one or two. Listen, by week four, we're doing this, and by, by week eight, you're doing that. All right, it doesn't have to be, it's just be rough, but it's it's something that you can then change and adapt over time. So when they come next, okay, this thing you're doing really well there, we're going to upgrade you a little bit, running is two weeks away, you know? Um, so they've got a goal to go towards and a reason for coming back. I also think it really helps you as a practitioner to plan out. If you're treating 30 clients a week, there's no way you can remember every single thing. And if, you know, that you need to be putting that in some sort of creating the overview for the patient because it's an overview for you. Okay. It's, 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 it's going, what am I going to do with this person? I've got to think, I've got to get this down and then look at it and go, yeah, that's not achievable. I've got to change that. Um, and then, so when they come in next time, you know, you know, the, the P you write down, you know, so tap and you've written the P and you've written it down. What, um, second. yeah. What, um, does that P stand for? Is it a plan for them or a plan for you? You know, it should be both. Okay, so what am I going to give this person? What is this person allowed to do? And what am I going to give this person? If they come in better, what's my next option? If they come in worse, what am I going to do? So you're not floundering around the session. You know exactly what is going to come next. Um, that's super important. That always needs to be the start of that program. And I think a lot of people miss that. Um, the second thing is make sure they have their mobility exercise. They have their set A exercises. They have their set B if you need to do, okay, this is what you're doing on Monday. This is what you're doing on Tuesday because I'm like Tim and I want to give you a million exercises, but I understand you can't do them all in one day, but I need you to cover quite a lot of things, okay? And what about the person I had, I, I swear to God, I had my last patient before I started this today. She's a, she finished at 6.30. She came in with four things. My new patient, four. Lower back, I've got an ACL partial rupture. I've sprained my ankle and I've got neck pain. And she wanted me to assess them all and tape her ankle because she's a nurse and she's up on her feet all day. And I've got an hour, I think. I've got an hour. And it's one of those people that, you know, it's hard to say. Most of the time you say, oh, we're... What's the most important thing right now for you? And she goes, oh, it's it's my ACL. I said, but you said, you know, she was struggling to stay at work because of back pain. Had to educate her that the most important thing we need to work on is her lower back because she won't, like, that's, that's you won't get an ACL right if you can't even function with your lower back. And so I try and educate her around that. Um, and then there's so many things going on. She's back in on Thursday. And we're finishing off the rest of the thing. I'm writing a program. I have to write a program for her because I'm seeing you guys. I have to write a, write a program for her tomorrow um, and push that through to her online and then get her doing those things, which is show her a few things, um, but get it back on Thursday because we just got to finish it off. But she needs like a set program of four things going on. What's the most priority? Okay, most priority is going to be your lower back and your neck. You're going to be doing this, this, and this. I'm going to treat you for that. And then... That's probably going to happen on Monday, Tuesday. And then you're going to, when you want to break from that, and you know, you'll say, listen, don't do it every day. You can, you know, do it Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three times a week. Cool. On the Tuesday, Thursday, you want your ACL on your ankle better. You've got to do those exercises on that day because you're not going to get it all done on one day. And this planning, the stuff that you've got to do is going to be the secret for that person. Okay. It's going to make me a better practitioner. If I can get that person doing all the right exercises and almost plan their life a little bit, you feel like a bit of a you know counselor sometimes, but plan their life from a rehab point of view. So they're going to get the damn thing done. Um, how many reps and sets they're doing. I had patients say to me, love that program, it's really good. But listen, I didn't do the lunge because I didn't know how many reps and sets to do, so I didn't do it. I'm going, are you serious? Like, yeah, yeah, I, I just I didn't want to do myself. Yeah. So some of these people, they need this written down. How many reps, how many sets are you going to do? It sounds good. How many times a week? These are the secrets. You get that down. You That person will, I guarantee it, that person will do those exercises way more. Okay. Um, then you go, okay, 
what am I doing special notes, okay? What are you not allowed to do, okay? For the person that go, the nurses in here, avoid sitting for long periods, okay? She's a nurse, a surgical nurse, she stands most of the time, that's fine. Okay, don't sit and go home and sit on the couch for two hours and then they'll have time to exercise. Go home and do exercises, okay? Tell her why she is not allowed to sit down because you've got a disc herniation L45 and it's protruding, all right? Sitting sucks for you, okay? Try and avoid that. You're allowed to sit for dinner and lunch, but try and avoid the long periods of sitting, all right? Go walking. It is good for you. All these sort of things. General exercise, do's and don'ts, you know? Sometimes people will need to advice on, should I be icing it? Should I be heating it? Should, what should I be doing? What meds should I be taking? If you can give advice on that. You know, you might have to go some part. Sometimes you that might not be everything you have to do in the first day, a week. Your program will morph and change. Oh, now all of a sudden I can do cardio. What cardio am I doing? How often am I doing it? Okay, get them exercising, get them moving, get them doing things, but write it down in the program and get it on there with a goal, with a timeline. You know, people who are returning to running, you know, I've given them a goal. Okay, you are running 1,000 meters this week and then, you know, you do it twice a week on a Monday and Thursday, and every week that goes past, we're going to upgrade you by 500 meters. And you're given these sort of like, and by sort of six weeks, you're doing three and a half K. How does that sound? That sounds awesome. But you have to do these exercises. To be able to get that three and a half K, you've got to do this moment. Okay, I'm done. I'm doing it. All right. And, you know, most people, I don't know about you, but most of I'm motivated by a goal. If I don't have a triathlon ahead of me, my training will not be as good. Okay, if someone does not have a goal in their program that you've written down, their rehab will not be as good. I will guarantee you they will not be doing as much as you want them to do if you don't set some goals and some realistic timelines throughout your program journey um, and changing it as they go. The goalpost, as they say, you know, that coin, the goalpost will shift. All right, and your job is to make sure that that program is updated. And then, obviously, uh, they work on referral scans and and even the last years of mental health. So that is your sort of um, overall um, program structure that we go through. Um, obviously, um, following that is the compliance issue, right? And I've got three things here. I've actually expanded this out in my course, but I just thought I'd touch on three things today before we, we sort of wrap up, is don't fall victim to the FOMO. And there are two FOMOs, the fear of missing out, one is the FOMO of I have to give them as many exercises as possible to get them better. I have to fix everything, okay? They will not do anything. You might, right, because you're really good. They probably won't, unless they are some. I've got some patients who are just the most favorite patients in the world because any exercise, the amount of exercise you give them, they do. They're amazing, but they're few and far between. Um, so make sure you don't fall that victim because if you put too many things in there and you don't spread it out and have a plan of going, because the phone was, oh, they might not come back for three or four sessions. Uh, so, I mean, I don't do three or four sessions, so I've got to pack it in and see and show how good I am. You know, all these great exercises. You're going to miss the boat. You've got to have the confidence to go, okay, we're doing this. The reason we're doing this is this, and then we're going to progress on next week. So I need you doing this because then we're upgrading next week and we're going on and on and on. You'll get a much better compliance with that because it won't be so hard for them. The other thing too is the second FOMO is making sure you don't start doing exercises that are too fancy pants. Okay, I've, <laughs> I won't name those. I follow someone on social media from overseas and he's not a physio, but he's doing stuff that is injury related. And he's bordering on from a being a P to a physio and doing, and this is the thing you've got to be wary of. You, a lot of trainers and exercise professionals are doing injury rehab on the net. And you just got to be aware of that. Um, but some of those exercises you're going, mate, no one's going to do that stuff. He's, it's, to the point where it's almost social media is taking over. He's, he's trying to do things that are just to get attention, too fancy. Bring it back to basics, okay? What does this person really need? Don't get too fancy on it. They don't, the majority of the population don't need fancy stuff. They need technical, solid, progressive exercises 
that challenge them slowly and carefully to get them where their goal is. Um, and so the education around the exercise is absolutely vital. That education comes from instruct and education why they're doing those exercises, the instruction and getting them doing them absolutely as perfectly as they possibly can. Um, so they do those exercises repeatedly, and that means um, being able to do them yourself. So the continuation of those exercises is the crucial part of that program. They adhere to the program, clients of the program, if they can continue it, okay, meaning you're progressing it, they're staying on board, they're getting results from those exercises, you're progressing and you keep working on that, so you can keep them progressing, they will stay on that program. If you only give them a couple of exercises and say, go away and do this for six weeks, they'll fall off that program. Okay, they need to be coming back and you changing it. And that actually gets them on board for longer. Okay, and then you'll get those results down the end. Um, so I hope that's helped some of you. I know it's a bit of a, this is more of an overview session, but I hope that sort of maybe opened up a few light bulbs in your guys or even just reinforced like, yep, yeah, that's exactly what I do. That's the right thing to do to help you um, improve what you're doing as practitioners.